Hey all, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna continue our scriptable cookbook series by looking at an idea called runtime sets. This is taken from Ryan Hipple's 2017 Unite Talk, which I think is a, a really important talk on this topic. But in watching the talk, there were a few ideas that I felt like he went over quickly and that we can maybe expand on a little bit. So I'm gonna to try to do that here. So the idea of a runtime set is a data set, basically a list of something that's either generated at runtime or that we need to access at runtime where we're putting those things into a list which is in an asset. What this means is that we can kind of use the Unity Inspector to do a form of dependency injection where we say, okay, if you need to know about all the enemies in the scene, this is the asset where that data is gonna be accessible at runtime. I feel like it's a really interesting approach to add to your toolbox and to be aware of, especially if you're interested in finding ways to avoid using singletons, which have a lot of problems that we can talk about a little bit. So let's get started and take a look. All right, so here we have our construction paper shooter project that we used in our last scriptable cookbook example. And now we've got these weird uh, post-it goatee enemies and we can shoot them and they die. And there's a little shooting sound effect. We've also added a new gun and just having fun. This is just me messing around with my kids, making a, a kind of silly looking game. Now. What we can see is that we have this enemy spawner object. This is actually our item area spawner from our procedural basics, just repurposed. And so what we're doing is we're spreading out 10 of these enemies over a 20 by 20 area. Now, here's the interesting thing. You'll actually, you may remember from the earlier video in the series, I created on the game manager this enemy manager script, right? And this was a kind of a singleton approach where I said, okay, I have a list of enemies. I'm gonna give them a reference to the player transform so that they can all use their nav mesh agents to, to path towards the player, right? Now, that's not happening. Instead, we're using a runtime set to share that data. And so what's going on is there's no reference to the player in the enemy spawner. Instead, the enemies each, if we look at our parent prefab here, this has this add game object to runtime set component, and then it has a reference to a scriptable object asset, right? So if we take a look at that scriptable object asset, now here's the part where I got a little tripped up in implementing this. I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a public list of game objects that could either be populated manually or be populated at runtime, right? And what I found in doing that was I ran into a type mismatch, right? Unity really doesn't like the idea of us taking scene objects and serializing them in a scriptable object asset. And the serializing is the key there because if you don't serialize the reference, right? AKA try to display it and write it into the inspector, then you can do this. You just won't be able to see it by the inspector, right? So that was something that wasn't mentioned in the talk and took me a little minute to figure out as I was doing this implementation. So what we do instead is we, let's take a look at our player, for example, because we, in this example, we have a player runtime set and an enemy runtime set. And those are basically lists of game objects in the scene. So if we look at our player, our player has this add game object to runtime set component as well, and a reference to a player runtime set scriptable object, right? So if we look at the code here, what we can see, it's super simple. We're just in on enable, we're calling game object runtime set dot add to list and passing in this game object. And we have a public variable of the type game object runtime set, which is what we're assigning in the inspector. Now let's go to the definition of this. And so this is just a class, an empty class that inherits from runtime set. Now here's what's important we're defining the type of the runtime set here, right? So we're saying we're gonna inherit from runtime set and we're gonna do it as game object. Because in our runtime set, 
Our runtime set is what's called a generic class. Now you may not be familiar with this, but it's basically a way that we can say, well, it might be a game object, it might be a transform, right? We're not gonna actually predefine the type. We're gonna define that later in the process, right? So this is our abstract base class where we don't actually know what type it is. We just know it's a set of items. So that may not be a totally familiar concept for you if you're newer to programming but it's not actually super complicated. It's just saying this is an undefined type that we're gonna define later. So again, our list then is also gonna be an, of an undefined type, right? And that's what that T means here, it's some type. And then we're gonna say, okay, we have a list of some type of items called items. That's gonna be a new equal to a new list. Now notice, importantly, this is private. And so we're not going to be accessing this from the inspector. We're not gonna be setting it directly. We're gonna be doing this all via functions. You could probably do this with a, a getter and a setter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a public variable that returns a type T, right? Whatever type we're working with called get item index. And this is just gonna return whatever item in our list. So if we want, you know, item index zero, we just pass in an integer index so that we can get it. Then we have two public functions to add and remove things from the list. We're kind of just wrapping the list.add function. We're adding in a little safety check to make sure we're not adding duplicates. And again, right, we're passing in a generic type thing to add. Could be a game object, could be a transform, whatever. So then we can add, if it's not in the list, we can add it to the list. And then the same thing, if it is in the list, we can remove it from the list, right? So that's our, our abstract base class. So then when we wanna actually be able to create scriptable object assets, then we just add this create asset menu attribute, right? That makes it appear in our menu under scriptable cookbook. Here is where we define the type, right? So we say, okay, make me an asset of the type runtime set that has the generic parameter now made concrete, specified to be game object. And so this gives us the, the flexibility to create, we can make transform, renderer, whatever we want, right? Multiple types of an asset that corresponds to each type, right? So the asset is not generic and flexible. The asset is a game object runtime set or whatever, I'm only doing game object right now, but, but we could have multiple types if we wanted to. So then when we wanna to add to it, we just call game object runtime set dot add to list this dot game object. And here the variable is a game object runtime set. So we know, okay, when we get something back from it, it's gonna be a game object, right? We know what the type is. Okay, so what that allows us to do, if we look, for example, at our enemy, in our enemy agent script, now, this is our enemy AI, right? And we want to be able to find the player. So what we have is a private transform called current target. That's what we want to set with the transform of the player. And so here we have a public game object runtime set, and we're going to assign the player set. So we drag in the player set. Right now, the player set only contains the player. And so then here we can just say player set, get item index, zero, you could also get a random index or, or a different number, right? If you want to, you can make it a variable here. I'm just saying I, own, I know I only have one player. So let's get index zero, right? The, the, the only thing in the, in the list. And then we're gonna get a reference to the transform, right? So I kind of like using a game object here because I could also get another component or kind of gives me the top of the hierarchy and then I can get the transform or I can get whatever else. So I feel like that's, that's nice. So then we can set the current target in start and do things with it in update. The way that we know that this is ready in start is because in our add game object to runtime set, which again, right, has a reference to that asset, we are adding it to the list and removing it from the list in on enable and on disable, right? So as soon as this game object comes into the world and is enabled, it's gonna say, oh, okay, I'm here in the world add me to this set, right? Add me to my, this set that's referenced by the asset. What's, what this is really solves, which is really painful and just miserable if you've experienced this, is a race condition associated with singletons, right? 
This is one of those things where if you've kind of been making small games and prototypes and game jam games, you may not have experienced, but once you start to do bigger projects, right, especially procedural projects where everything's getting dynamically generated, you have this situation where the enemy wakes up, looks for the enemy manager, but the enemy manager hasn't been spawned or the enemy manager hasn't been initialized or the player, the player isn't there, so he can't find the player or, you know, any number of kind of unpleasant order of operations issues that you can run into where it's, it, <laughs> I can't tell you how unpleasant this is. So, so this is really solving a, a painful issue that you kind of may run into down the road. Now I'm not saying this is the one true way. This is the only architecture everybody should use, right? Architecture is like religion, right? Every game architecture, right? Is like religion. Everybody has a very strong uh, opinion about it and you got to make up your mind for yourself, right? I'm also, this is still a, an approach that I have only recently started to experiment with. So I'm still figuring it out myself, right? But I do think that it's, uh, it's promising and interesting and just worth having in your library of, of patterns and concepts. The other thing that this solves as well is if you want to do like a demo scene or a tutorial scene where you drop in the player. Oh, I forgot to drop in the game manager. Oh, I forgot to drop in the sound manager. I forgot to drop in the UI. And then eventually you end up dropping in your whole game into your demo scene. Here, I can take, if we go back to Unity, we basically, the enemy spawner just spawns. I could delete the enemy spawner after it's done its work. There's actually nothing happening on the game manager. I can take off my enemy manager. That's not doing anything. Player here, doesn't have to know anything about the enemies or or anything right it's now all we're doing all the dependency injection providing all the information about the world and the connections in the world via these assets so it's it's pretty interesting approach that i think gives you a lot of flexibility if you have tried this out or had any experiences with it i'd be super interested to hear them i'm going to continue playing with it and i'll update you guys on my findings if i think of more cool things to do with it through through this series if you missed the previous video in the series i'll put a card to it somewhere up here and if you're looking for more content about scriptable objects, we've got a couple of videos that I'll, I'll place on the screen here for you guys to check out. If you're enjoying the content, please do drop a like on the video and consider subscribing. And as always, I really appreciate you guys spending a little bit of your uh, precious time with me and I will see you next time. I just hit my hand on the desk. I will see you next time.